Protea has opted for mice. Less conventional, but possibly more reliable. Already totally adapted to a nectar diet is the Australian honey possum, the trapeze artist of the marsupial world. With half a dozen teeth and enormously long tongue, it has an amazing capacity for drink, albeit nectar. Grasping fingers and a gripping tail enable it to live in the tops of trees, many of which have evolved flowers which offer a copious supply of nectar, especially for this delightful little tippler. In Central America, nectar-rich flowers have evolved for hummingbirds. And at last, the secret of Ginger's love life can be revealed. Guarded by ants, it's strictly for the birds. Prodigious appetites for nectar, hummers have become the willing slaves of the plant's reproductive strategy. To be successful, plants may appear to us to be beautiful, ugly, even revolting, depending on whom they're trying to attract, whom to deceive. In style more appropriate for ancient Egyptian kings, Blowflies pay a last tribute to the dead by laying their little gifts, their eggs, upon the corpse. And soon their maggots have the gruesome but necessary task of eating the world free from putrefying flesh and stinking carrion. difficult to believe that on a beautiful, uninhabited island off the coast of Sardinia, there is a plant which has adopted these very blowflies as its go-betweens. This lily, a kind of arum, is surely a conception of the Marquis de Sade. In the chamber below is a most elaborate structure. A dark passage with a huge central column supporting a battery of male stamens. Beneath is a crown of spikes guarding a second battery of female flowers. The perfume of this flower, the stench of a rotting corpse, is so powerful that it is irresistible to flies which swarm in from all over the island. From the first day the flower opens, female flies land and start to search for the dankest and darkest place to lay their eggs. They make for the deep, hairy throat, which becomes, as they pass the guard hairs, a one-way street, up which there can be no return for at least two days. 
or maybe not at all. They feed on nectar, oblivious of danger. Any pollen they might by chance be carrying is brushed off on the receptive female flowers as they reach the murky depths. So good, so realistic is the foul smell of carrion, so brilliant the deception. The flies actually lay their eggs pointlessly. For even though they hatch, the maggots find no real carrion, nothing on which to feast, and die of hunger. On the second day of kidnapping, the male stamens burst open and shower the wretched captives with sticky pollen. The first casualties occur in this insect charnel house. Exhausted flies are trampled to death by fellow inmates. However, to kill is not the intention, nor is it at all in the plant's interest. On the third day, the guard hairs wither, and the survivors find themselves suddenly able to escape. Dusty with pollen, they emerge, groggy, but still eager to find a bit of real rotting flesh, or as the plant intends, enter another chamber of horrors. But why is this arum found here only on some small Mediterranean islands? The resident gulls with their chick births, smelly, regurgitated food and inevitable deaths, are probably part of the reason, for there would naturally be blowflies about, only too easily duped and kidnapped. Of course, there is a risk to the go-betweens, but sometimes the risk is to the pollen itself. <laughs> 